I'm Darren Davis, and it's my great honor to serve as director of the Institute for Faith and Learning at Baylor University. And on behalf of my colleagues in IFL who have uh, spent many months planning this conference, these conferences actually, uh, and on behalf of my colleagues throughout the university, welcome, welcome to Baylor University. We're so grateful for the presence of those of you who represent Lilly Fellows Program institutions. Um, you all represent for us uh, in many ways uh, fellow sojourners, uh, fellow travelers, those who are uh, committed to the cause of church-related higher education. You strengthen our efforts here. Baylor was a charter member of LFP in 1991. We could not be more pleased and honored to have you return here uh, for this occasion, for the character of the university. We're also especially thrilled to be able to do something that uh, uh, maybe builds character in us, uh, something like fortitude. Fortitude requires that you can be wounded. I think we've dodged a few bullets. Uh, but we are absolutely thrilled to have uh, those of you who are a part of the 2019 Baylor Symposium on Faith and Culture, ba the IFL's annual conference held for many years. Together, the two conferences represent, um, in registration numbers, over 500 and 170 institutions. For a topic like the character of the university, I think it's a special strength that we have that many institutions represented in what we think is such an important conversation. As you all know, these things cannot be done without uh, strong support of university administration. And it's a great honor and a delight to introduce to you, who will give you a welcome today, our provost at Baylor, Dr. Nancy Brickhouse. Welcome. I'm delighted to welcome you to Baylor University and to also welcome you to Celebration. Hope you enjoy the uh, hope you enjoy the show. Uh, it is a delight to share this space with colleagues across the country who care deeply about student formation. And one of the aspects of Baylor University that is really special to me is that here we care not only about uh, about education as what happens in the head, but also about what happens in the heart, what happens in the soul. And of course, this cannot be accomplished alone. It requires a community that both values diversity, but also understands what its core values are. This symposium is addressing core ideas of what a university is, and never have we needed this more, as we need young men and women that can offer moral leadership to our country and to our world and can live lives that are pleasing to God. I want to say a special thanks to Darren Davis for the organization of this conference and to Joe Creech for his leadership of the Lilly Foundation. And I look forward to hearing more from you over the weekend. Please enjoy your stay and again, welcome. One of the great joys of putting this conference together is to work with the tremendous team of the Lilly Fellows Program, the Humanities and the Arts, Joe Goss, Jenna Van Sickle, and Joe Creech. They are dear friends of ours who we have spent uh, many minutes and hours in conversation with, sometimes face to face, sometimes over the phone about uh, all the details of this great conference. We thank them for their friendship. They could not be uh, better people to work with for such an endeavor. So we're uh, grateful for them, for their friendship. I'd like now to introduce Joe Creech. Thank you so much, Darren. Thank you so much, Provost Brickhouse. Uh, it is indeed wonderful to be here uh, on your campus. And on behalf of Mark Schwain, our founding director, and on, on behalf of Joe Goss and Jenna Van Sickle, and the hundred schools that make up the Lilly Network of Church-Related Colleges and Universities, I'd like to welcome you to this, our, uh, our 29th annual national conference. And I was so excited uh, when Darren first floated the idea 
of combining uh, our annual national conference with the IFL National Symposium. Uh, what a great opportunity uh, to come together uh, over our shared desire to explore the connections between faith and learning. I want to take just a minute to tell you a little about the Lilly Fellows Program for those of you who may not know uh, about it. Uh, it started in 1991, uh, as you already said, and its aim has been simple. It's to strengthen church-related higher education. It does this primarily through providing opportunities for conversation like this conference and also through leadership development. And we meet these two goals through three integrated initiatives. And the first of these is our Lilly Network of Church-Related Colleges and Universities. And uh, we meet annually uh, in this uh, from campus to campus this year, of course, at Baylor University. And also uh, tied to this conference each year is a, a workshop for senior administrators. Um, we are a um, self-sustaining and self-governed network. It's governed by a 12 member board. And aside from bringing folks together at large venues like this, we sponsor a number of campus projects. Uh, network schools can apply for grants to hold mentoring programs, faculty development programs on their campuses, or to hold regional conferences and collaboration. I'm excited that uh, through the first 29 years of our history, uh, that we've focused on humanities and the arts, uh, but we're just now uh, starting a new uh, projects and programs uh, that um, go across the disciplines, and particularly the STEM professional and, and uh, social scientific fields. And we just began a project called the Lilly Faculty Fellows Program that's in its first year uh, for mid-career faculty uh, to think about the connections of faith and learning across the disciplines and particularly in these disciplines. Uh, the second of these three initiatives is our Lilly Graduate Fellows Program. And this is a program for graduates of our network schools uh, during the first three years of their graduate work uh, en route uh, to becoming professors. And so this uh, three-year program uh, has, uh, brings uh, these Lilly Graduate Fellows together for four conferences. They meet with a mentor for three years who is a faculty member, a senior scholar at one of our network schools. And also um, they attend or, or participate in an online colloquium uh, with common readings. They also, and not um, uh, insignificantly, receive three $3,000 scholarships uh, to use at their discretion. This is um, not a program, it's not a Bible study. Uh, it's not a program designed to shield uh, graduate students from the academy. What it really is at heart is uh, an ecumenical and interdisciplinary opportunity uh, to engage the sort of professionalization process that goes on in graduate school, to engage that with um, the habits of thought and mind uh, that are rooted in the Christian intellectual tradition. And in doing so, it provides uh, clarity about the academic vocation, uh, opportunities to strengthen teaching, and also uh, the opportunity to engage uh, in the Christian intellectual tradition. The third and original program that gives us our name is the Lilly Postdoctoral Fellows Program at Valparaiso University. This is a two-year residential postdoctoral fellowship uh, where um, resident, those in residence come to teach uh, to pursue their academic and artistic work and also to explore, uh, as you might imagine, the meaning of church relatedness. Uh, there have now been 80 Lilly postdoctoral fellows who join 145 Lilly graduate fellows. Many of the Lilly graduate fellows and postdoctoral fellows are here with us. Uh, you've maybe had a chance to meet them. And in fact, uh, the eighth cohort of 11 cohorts of Lilly graduate fellows are also, that cohort is here with us. Um, but I'd also like to introduce our current, three of our four current Lilly uh, postdoctoral fellows who happen to be here with us. I'm gonna ask them to stand and embarrass themselves. The first I'd like to introduce is Dr. Jason Gerke. Uh, he's a historical theologian. And he earned his PhD at Marquette University uh, he studies the interrelationships of Christology, political theology, and ethics uh, in the ancient and modern period, as well as in biblical literature. And his current project is an extensive rereading of Lactantius's response to the Diocletian persecution. Dr. Christine Hedlund uh, got her PhD in uh, English uh, from the University of Illinois at uh, Champagne, or sorry, Urban, Urbana Champagne. I always say Champagne Urbana. Um, her research interests are 19th century American literature, American church history, uh, and historical approaches to the novel. And she's currently working on uh, a book project that examines how American Protestants um, used popular religious novels to explore uh, their faith. And Dr. Jillian Snyder uh, received her PhD from Notre Dame, also in English, uh, though she focuses on the spiritual and somatic experiences of Protestants in early modern England. Her current project examines uh, how preachers and stage performers 
grappled with lived bodily experience. I commend all three of these fellows to you, and I hope you get to know them as well as the other fellows uh, attending. And finally, uh, I just want again to thank you, Darren, for having us here. Um, uh, already, uh, we're having a wonderful conference, just uh, getting to know folks and um, uh, being here at this place. And you and the IFL staff have welcomed us so warmly. Um, I do want to thank, uh, I see Matthew Bixler back there, but if you see um, Lori Knitz and Vicki Schultz, um, they deserve a round of applause for the um, incredible <laughs> logistics that they pulled together for this conference. Thank you so much, Darren. I too want to uh, say thank you, and I'll say thank you again to my dear colleagues, Lori Knitz, Nathan Hayes, Matthew Bixer, Vicki Schultz who've helped so much. Uh, a colleague asked me yesterday, did I have uh, enough help? Did I have enough people? And I said, I have the right people. And I do. The title of our conference that gathers us together is The Character of the University. What motivated us to put this conference together was a sincere desire to generate reflection about the project of intellectual, moral, and spiritual formation in higher education. To explore the questions about how that goes on across the life of the university, but more important, how those efforts require each and every one of us to explore serious questions about identity and mission with our own institutions and personal vocation as well. I want to just tell you all how thrilled we are to have Talbot Brewer and Candace Vogler to begin this conversation. And I want to begin straight away with introducing them and letting them provide remarks for this opening panel presentation titled The Character of the University's Pathologies and Prospects. Talbot Brewer is professor of philosophy at the University of Virginia. He specializes in ethics and political philosophy with particular attention to moral psychology and Aristotelian ethics. He's been a visiting professor in the Harvard University Philosophy Department and has been invited to present his work to audiences at a number of universities and professional conferences in North America, South America, Europe, China, and the Middle East. Among his works is uh, the 2009 book, which I commend to all of you, titled The Retrieval of Ethics. Candace Vogler is the David B. and Clara E. Stern Professor of Philosophy at the University of Chicago. She also currently serves as the Chair of Virtue Theory for the Jubilee Center for Character and Virtues at the University of Birmingham in the United Kingdom, and was named a Fellow of the Royal Institute of Philosophy. From 2000 to 2007, she served as co-director of the Master of Arts program in the Humanities at Chicago. Her research interests include virtue ethics, social and political philosophy, cultural studies, philosophy, and literature. And in 2015, she received a major Templeton Foundation grant for her project, Virtue, Happiness, and the Meaning of Life, a project that brings together philosophers, social scientists, and religious thinkers to examine the role of self-transcendence and self-transcendent goods in meaningful lives. Both Professor Vogler and Professor Brewer think in graceful and compelling ways about the aims of higher education. Would you join me in welcoming Talbot Brewer and Candace Vogler? Thank you so much, Darren. Uh, th and thanks to all the organizers of these two conferences that are coming together here in this room. Um, this has been the platonic ideal of a conference and of conference organizers, and I'm, I'm very humbled to be part of it and very grateful to have been included. Um, so uh, as, as Darren just told you, our, our topic is um, the character of the university, pathologies and prospects, and um, we agreed upon a rough division of labor. I'm going to do the pathologies. And, uh, so, um, so you know, the, uh, uh, the, the good news is uh, going to come a little later in our program. Um, okay. So where do you look for the character of the university? Uh, I mean, you could look in lots of places, it seems to me. You might try to tease that character out of investment decisions or the language that we use to describe ourselves to prospective students 
or what we require our students to study or how we are reshaping, reshaping our curricular offerings. But today I'm going to look at our explicit teachings about the good life for human beings. Uh, that is, I'm going to look at what those who teach at universities say in their published works and what they teach our students in our lecture halls about what counts as a good life. When we look here, we see that our colleges and universities are teetering, or it seems to me, on the brink of incoherence. The conceptions of the, of the human good that shape our teachings and our research are fundamentally inhospitable to the ideal of liberal education. This is true in such popular majors as psychology and economics and in the study of public policy and law, but also to a lamentable extent in my own field, philosophy. We can't make, it seems to me, a case for our traditional mission, and especially for the central place of the humanities in that mission, through the evaluative lens that we encourage students to affirm. It's only if they reject the bulk of our explicit teachings about the human good that our students will be able to make sense of the value of the liberal education that we offer them, the education to which many of us are dedicated and to which many of our institutions remain devoted, at least nominally and often in very much more robust ways. So let's begin with conceptual foundations. At the most basic level, we tell our students that there are two kinds of goodness that a life can have. It can be good for the person living the life, or it can be good in some more objective sense. We often name the first of these kinds of goodness well-being, and the second moral goodness. And we say these two kinds of goodness can conflict so that one could lead a life that is better for oneself, uh, even by being highly immoral, for instance, if one got away with it. Uh, I, I don't think there are two separate species of goodness uh, to theorize about. I don't think, for instance, that when we try to raise our children uh, and uh, bring them up so that they are morally good, we are knowingly placing limits on how well their lives can go for them and doing so solely out of consideration for others. I think that the only real goodness that locutions like goodness for you can pick out is ordinary, objective goodness when it appears in your life. I think this goodness includes certain demands that we moderns would call moral, but that these are woven into a wider conception of human flourishing that does not require nor leave con conceptual space for a separate thing called self-interest or a separate theory called a theory of well-being. So I think the confusions of the contemporary academy are rooted in a truly fundamental confusion about what kinds of goodness there are. The idea that there are two radically different kinds of goodness, objective goodness on the one hand and person relativized or prudential goodness on the other, uh, is first made explicit in the writings of such figures as Bishop Butler and William Wollaston in the early 18th century. It is then of relatively recent vintage, but in the 300 years since it was articulated, it has gained great cultural prestige. Historians of ethics like Henry Sidgwick and Terence Irwin, both quite influential in telling us how we got here when it comes to how we think ethically, uh, regard it as a decisive advance in Western ethics. Uh, that we came to divide the field of the good in this way, an advance that leads us beyond the blind alleys and confusions of Plato and Aristotle, and I would mention also Augustine and Aquinas. As I've already made clear, I disagree. I think, in fact, that it's a cultural calamity, and I think it is more than coincidence that this turn in our thought serves to liberate the realm of desire from the sort of conscientious oversight that might otherwise have sharply limited the rise of consumer capitalism. Uh, still, my uh, thoughts about these matters aside, there are lots of folks around the university who think it is the merest common sense that there's a separative, more normative inquiry to be done and that is centered on what is good for this person and what's good for that person. They call it the study of welfare or well-being or sometimes happiness studies. Um, <clears throat> And this is the study of what makes life go well for the person living it. Uh, such goodness is supposed to be brutally indexed to the person whose goodness it is. Now, how might we explain this brute indexing to particular persons of this special kind of goodness? The most obvious proposal um, is that something is good for person X 
if that person uh, has some favorable attitude towards it. For instance, if X desires it or prefers it or approves of it. And the literature on well-being is rife with views of this uh, broad kind. To take one influential example, the philosopher L.W. Sumner holds that prudential value is conferred upon um, is conferred by a pro-attitude that he calls personal life satisfaction. And this involves, he tells us, quoting from him, an endorsement or affirmation of the conditions of one's life. Now, the problem with this proposal is that one begins to fall into circularity as soon as one tries to say what it is to affirm or endorse the conditions of one's life. Presumably, this is a matter of seeing something good or valuable about them but what sort of goodness or value? The answer can't very well be objective goodness. It would be bizarre to suppose that things go well for us when we perform objectively bad activities under the mistaken idea that they are objectively good and that they begin to go worse for us as soon as we awaken to our error and gain an inkling of their objective badness. Presumably then, when we endorse our activities in Sumner's sense, we see them as good for us rather than as good objectively. But uh, Sumner tells us that goodness for us just is the property that our activities have when we affirm or endorse them. And that would mean that to affirm or endorse an activity is to view it as something that one, if we view it as good for oneself, that means that we're viewing it as something that one affirms or endorses. And to ponder whether to affirm or endorse an activity is to ponder whether one does affirm or endorse it. And that is fair nonsense. But it, it's just the sort of, nonsense that we should expect if we try to ground the value of some array of our life activities in our approbation of them rather than understanding our approbation as answerable to their value. The former alternative leaves nothing for approbation to be, or at least nothing that could sensibly be seen as a lodestar for key life decisions. This problem generalizes to other subjectivist efforts to specify the sort of value that a theory of well-being is supposed to capture. Such theories suffer from a recurring defect. They are reflectively unstable from the point of view of the first person deliberator. This is because they relativize reasons or goods to subjective states that appear in the course of deliberation to be wholly unsuited to the task of determining what it would be good for us to do because they themselves are subjective outlooks on what is good and their dependability is fair game for deliberative review. Now, I don't mean to deny that a palpable appreciation of the value of one's life is an essential part of the best life. I think it is. But appreciation is a success term. It involves awareness of genuine goodness or value. I can't appreciate what you say but not have the least idea what you actually said. I have to know it before I can appreciate it. It is something that requires genuine and merited appreciation rather than just a, an attitude that could attach to anything. Hence, we can ins insist upon the value of vivid appreciation of one's own doings without committing ourselves to the existence of an essentially perspectival or person-relative kind of goodness. Now, I think the objection I've just sketched creates insuperable problems for the conception of the good life or the conceptions of the good life that structure research in several contemporary academic disciplines. But I'll focus mostly on the rapidly growing field of positive psychology which aims to shed light on what sort of life is good for the person leading it. It aims to do this through an expanded science of psychology, one that reaches beyond psychological crises and their avoidance to human flourishing and its promotion. And when I say the field is rapidly growing, I run the risk of understatement. The field is about 20 years old and already it's become a, a, a large presence in the discipline and an even larger presence in the teaching of our undergraduates. The most popular course right now at both Harvard and Yale is a course, in each case, in the psychology of happiness. Uh, both of these courses focus on what's sometimes called hacking the brain, that is outsmarting the neural glitches that keep us from feeling good about ourselves and our lives on a more consistent basis. The Yale course, taught by Lori Santos, recently drew an enrollment of 1,200 students. That's to say a quarter of the Yale student body. At that rate, 
if it were offered annually, and um, then every, every Yale student would, would take it by graduation. Um, the Harvard enrollment figures for the class, the similar class taught there are equally astounding. Both courses have an influence that extends well beyond the classroom in the form of popular books, podcasts, online courses, and YouTube lectures. They constitute, I would say, the public face of academic teachings about the good life. Uh, and we might say that at least thinking in a certain light about the character of the university, they might well constitute the de facto character of the university, at least its public facing edge. The foundational normative stances of positive psychologists fall into two broad categories. In the first category are hedonic theories that equate well-being with subjective feelings of pleasure or contentment. In the second category are so-called eudaimonic theories that equate well-being with objective psychological conditions or achievements of one sort or another. Ed Diener, a well-known positive psychologist who favors a broadly hedonic theory and who happens to teach at my university, full disclosure, um, has criticized the eudaimonists for improperly pretending to what he thinks of as special expertise about the good life when they should be deferring to the views of those whom they study in the course of attempting to arrive at a conception of what the good life consists in. That charge interests me because it seems to me that none of the theorists under discussion really defer to the views of those whose lives they are examining when they arrive at their theories. All parties to the debate assume that well-being is to be sought in abstract commonalities among the activities and experiences that different subjects count as particularly fulfilling. That methodological assumption, without which it would not be remotely tempting to call the inquiry a science, is itself a controversial and I think uh, thoroughly unscientific claim about the good life, hence a covert form of presumed expertise. Furthermore, it's a claim that would almost certainly be rejected by many, maybe even most of the subjects uh, to whose views uh, Diener and other researchers uh, take themselves to be deferring. Consider in this vein those hedonic theories that take well-being to consist in pleasure in the absence of pain. Perhaps they've arrived at these views by asking people when their lives are going particularly well and noting that in most or all such cases, these people also report experiencing pleasure, at least not experiencing pain. The difficulty that is that it's exceedingly doubtful that their respondents would agree with the finding that has been reached by observing them. My limited experience with classroom polling suggests that most people, when prodded to reflect on their own picture of what would make their life go well, deny that it comes down to pleasurable experiences. So we might ask why psychologists have observed so striking a regularity between what people call fulfilling and what they uh, and, and those moments when they say that they're experiencing pleasure. One possibility, first expressed in uh, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, is that taking pleasure in an activity is often a matter of completing the activity with a running appreciation, a savoring, as it were, of whatever it is that seems to make it a good activity. If this is right, then pleasure is likely to show up as a common element in the otherwise vastly different activities or experiences that different people see as particularly fulfilling or worthwhile. This, however, does not in any way indicate that people value the activities they do because of the pleasures they derive from them. At least from the first personal standpoint, the explanation would seem to run in the other direction. The pleasure is taken in the activity because the activity is regarded as in some way worthwhile. Perhaps there's a class of pleasures that lack this sort of internal conceptual complexity, but I don't think it is remotely persuasive to trace all of the elements of the good life, or even the bulk of them, to this rather narrow class of pleasures. Tacit acceptance of a broadly Aristotelian picture of pleasure might help to explain why we do not tend to think that our lives would go better if we began to take intense pleasure in trivial but easily achievable activities like humming to ourselves or counting blades of grass rather, rather than say falling in love or dwelling on good poetry. So there's good reason to believe that most of us are Aristotelians uh, about pleasure whether we know it or not. But if we are then hedonic theories of well-being cannot plausibly be said to defer to the value of the people whose fulfillment they study. A similar problem confronts 
Diener's influential suggestion, accepted by many other positive psychologists, that well-being consists largely in life satisfaction. Such satisfaction is presumably a matter of the concordance of one's life with one's desires or preferences. But from the first personal standpoint, we don't take our desires or preferences to be infallible guides to what it would be good for us to do. We often ask what we should desire or prefer with an eye to coming to desire or to prefer just those things that are genuinely desirable or uh, preferable, that is good or worthwhile. For example, the Christian believer's desire to imitate Christ appears from the inside to track rather than determine what would make the Christian's life go ideally well. Uh, you know, he, uh, that, that Christian, he or she would presumably not judge that if instead he or she had a strong desire to mock Christian beliefs, then sudden, suddenly or under that circumstance, uh, his well-being would lie there. Um, now, it might seem as if the problem I've been examining is endemic only to hedonic theories of well-being or um, at any rate to subjective theories of well-being and that, uh, uh, that eudaimonic theories of well-being are free of it. But when we consider some of the most common elements of these eudaimonic theories, I think we can begin to identify the same sort of problem. On one contemporary eudaimonic view, this, this is Waterman's, well-being consists in personal expressiveness. Another prominent view, that of Riffin Singer, uh, takes well-being to have six elements. Autonomy, personal growth, self-acceptance, life purpose, mastery, positive relatedness. A third view, due to DC and Ryan, grounds well-being in autonomy, competence, and relatedness. What these views have in common is that they locate well-being in highly abstract properties of basic projects and commitments. Beyond these abstract desiderata, any old project or commitment will do. Again, that's the sort of result that one might expect to arrive at by asking people what, uh, in their view, makes their lives go well and abstracting away the differences in hopes of identifying common features. But such a procedure is likely to yield a very different picture of well-being than is actually affirmed from the inside by the subjects being studied. After all, many of these subjects are presumably quite concerned about the adequacy of their beliefs about how best to spend their lives. Um, to return to the case of the religious believer, it strains credulity to suppose that those whose life-orienting commitment is to the imitation of Christ would regard their pursuit as good simply because they've autonomously chosen it. They would presumably say that they've chosen it because it's where their true good lies, insofar as choice was at issue at all. Uh, nor would they say that it's good because it provides a generic occasion, a generic occasion for personal growth. They would presumably favor growth only if it approaches what's genuinely good, and they might well deny the name growth, unlike those positive psychologists who make use of the term, um, to anything that did not. It's generally used uh, to name those conditions under which we have the impression that we're moving forward in our in pursuits that we regard as valuable. Um, and so there's a subjectivization of growth as it's wielded in this field. Um, nor would the believer be likely to say um, that uh, the imitation of Christ uh, is valuable because it induces him or puts him in a position to accept himself. Uh, he would presumably say that self-acceptance is valuable only if merited, and further, that rejection of certain aspects of the self is itself a sign that one is living well rather than badly. Nor, it seems to me, would such a person say that uh, the imitation of Christ is uh, good because it gives his life some, some purpose or another, again, uh, holding the particular content of the purpose open. Uh, rather, he would presumably insist upon having a particular and a worthy purpose. Um, nor, it seems to me, would this pursuit be vindicable from the inside uh, in terms of uh, the way in which it opens up the possibility of experiencing sense of competence or mastery or what's sometimes called flow. Uh, a believer might feel barely competent to pursue uh, his life commitments uh, and uh, even if a believer does enjoy a certain flow in elements of um, religious devotional activity, perhaps in prayer, uh, that believer would 
presumably refuse to affirm that if some other activity produced a similar flow, that would make it an adequate substitute. Um, nor, it seems to me, would such a believer be likely to um, affirm the value of the activity because it involves uh, him or her in generic relations with other people. Uh, believers would presumably seek only very special kinds of relations. Now, I've, I've thought this through with the case of a Christian be believer uh, seeking to imitate Christ, but I think that a wide array of uh, familiar uh, life commitments and pursuits would uh, serve equally well to provide a basis for showing that this language does not provide an adequate substitute from the first person point of view for um, uh, the, the, the language that one might, uh, that one does put in, uh, in use, uh, that we all do try to put in use uh, to think about how we're to uh, confront and rise to this uh, bizarre challenge of living this life that we uh, have uh, received and uh, that we have it before us to, uh, to make our way through. Um, now, I think, and I'm, I'm not going to belabor this point, but I do think that structurally similar criticisms can be leveled at the normative foundations of a number of other disciplines, or at least the center of gravity of the normative foundations of another of, a number of other disciplines in the contemporary economy. I'm thinking of welfare economics, uh, and I'm thinking of the use of the tools of welfare economics uh, uh, in cost-benefit analysis as taught in the study of public policy. I'm thinking of uh, those same tools put to use in the normative assessment of law through uh, under the rubric of the law and economics approach uh, to the assessment of law, uh, which has a strong presence at my own university, and I think yours as well. Um, it seems to me that uh, you know, very similar critiques uh, can be raised uh, in light of or, you know, it, uh, with respect to those teachings. And again, uh, those teachings are uh, reach the ears of many of our students and, and arguably, I mean, perhaps they're even rivals for the teachings of positive psychology uh, as the most publicly influential uh, offerings of our colleges and universities to the task of helping us to think about what does and doesn't conduce to the good life for human beings. Uh, but I'm going to set that topic aside uh, and, um, <clears throat> and, and, and think a little bit about the humanities and what it might uh, be to try to vindicate them through the tools that we ourselves as universities and colleges are offering our students. Uh, so the hope of the positive psychology movement is to guide us in reshaping our lives and our institutions so as to promote human flourishing. Again, cost-benefit analysis uh, has a very similar uh, ambition. Um, presumably, both of these creations of the Contemporary Academy purport to be apt tools for answering questions about uh, whether the study of the humanities contributes to or detracts from our students' prospects for living good lives, and whether we ought to continue to emphasize the humanities in our curricular offerings, though perhaps certain cost-benefit analysts would restrict their focus to public universities like my own. Um, when I say, when I said at the outset that the Contemporary Academy is verging on incoherence, what I meant was that these tools of evaluation, which are easily the most influential tools that academics are offering up to the public these days, the ones that our students are most likely to learn about on their way through our courses, are hopeless for articulating the real value of a traditional liberal education with a healthy dose of the humanities. That's not to say that they would yield the conclusion that such education is valueless. I'm not sure whether they would. It would really depend upon the tastes and talents that have been inculcated in our students and their use, and that's going to be a, 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 something that changes year to year, uh, not a fixed uh, lodestar for institutional identity. Uh, it is only to say that whatever verdict these instruments of evaluation issued forth it would be issued for entirely the wrong reasons, reasons that have almost nothing to do with the actual value of liberal education. I lack the time to vindicate this last claim in full, but I suspect it will be obvious to most of you just how inapt it would be to claim that the value of reading, say, Dostoevsky or Plato, is that it adds to the positive hedonic tone of one's prevailing emotions, or leaves one feeling satisfied with one's life. 
or makes a measurable contribution to an abstract property called relatedness to others, rather than, say, making one's relations more interesting, complicated, and perhaps, with a little luck, deeper and richer. Or that it fosters a generic sense of competence or mastery. It might just do the opposite. Or that it fulfills a desire one already had before encountering those texts. It probably doesn't. You have to see them to see what's desirable about them. Or that it brings into existence desires that it would be easier to fulfill over the course of one's life than the ones one came to them with. Certainly not. The list could go on. But if we restrict ourselves to the items emphasized by our positive psychologists, um, the list is sure to be inapt. In fact, as your laughs were beginning to show, I think it would be comically inapt. So um, I suppose I'll leave you with the following couple of questions. How has it come? Uh, how has it come about that we're promulgating conceptions of the human good in this public and influential way that cannot make proper sense of our historic mission? Second, what, if anything, might we do to bring ourselves into greater coherence? Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Um, I share a tell suspicion <laughs> of the way that universities are producing tools for trying to think about human good that are utterly inadequate to thinking about human good generally, and the suspicion that the fact that these tools are both very public and very inadequate prevents people at universities from rethinking their own mission and what their research is supposed to be for. Um, I, and my sense is that's part of the moral of this story. Um, I am going to think a little bit about uh, all kinds of things about intellectual and personal formation, which are things that are happening in universities, whether we pay attention to them or not. Part of what's so scary about those happiness courses is that they involve intellectual and moral formation at the same time in these big, big, big lectures. Okay, um, so I'm gonna start, start us off up north at the place where I make my academic home, then sort of bring us closer to here. My home institution uh, the University of Chicago does not have a mission statement. It used to, we don't anymore. We just have a motto. Um, our motto is, let knowledge grow, let life be enriched. That seems to suggest that the growth of knowledge will all on its own improve life. Now, that can happen, of course. Knowledge is really important and a really great good. But advances in knowledge need not translate directly into better lives for those who seek knowledge or those who acquire it, much less for the larger society. To bring the two halves of my university's motto together, intellectual excellence needs to be shaped and directed by, I think, humility, honesty, justice, courage, and compassion, qualities that belong to good character. Now, the University of Virginia recognizes this point in laying out its core values and purpose. Howell's Home Institution tells us that their work is defined by, quote, enduring commitment to a vibrant and unique residential learning environment marked by the free and collegial exchange of ideas, unwavering support of a collaborative, diverse community bound together by distinctive foundational values of honor, integrity, trust, and respect, and universal dedication to excellence and affordable access, close quote. They want to produce good citizens and good leaders. Baylor also wants to produce good leaders. Most universities these days want to produce good leaders. Baylor proposes to do so by integrating academic excellence with Christian commitment. The point about integration is 
crucial. In my experience, both undergraduates and graduate students are undergoing intense intellectual formation and deep personal development at the same time while they're with us. It might seem like those of us, those of those we faculty, those of us faculty at, whose teaching and research places us firmly in the regions of humanistic inquiry are going to find it easy to bring the two forms of development together. We can direct our students to read materials aimed at central questions in human life. We can invite students to think about, you know, fictional figures caught up in imaginary events that illustrate human strengths and weaknesses, love or loss, struggle and the like. We can assign work on ethics or politics, in law and letters, and so on. In short, maybe we could get the integration part for free because the knowledge we're helping them acquire is already actually or at least potentially ethical. It touches on fundamental questions in human life. Now, I have colleagues who are convinced that a liberal arts education understood as involving work across the sciences and humanities, very serious exposure to some great books and practice with critical thinking, all on its own will make us good human beings, good neighbors, and good citizens. Now, I'm as big a fan of liberal arts education as anyone in this room, but I don't think that completing a degree at a liberal arts institution is going to transform good students into excellent human beings. At least, I don't see much evidence of this. <laughs> now, I mean, my university is on the south side of Chicago. We provide a solid liberal arts education to our undergraduates. We have a strong faculty. We have a president, a provost, and a number of deans, all of whom take humanistic inquiry seriously, whether or not their doctorates are in humanistic disciplines. We understand that humanistic inquiry matters. The 63rd Street stop on the Chicago Public Transit's red line train is about three blocks from campus. Babies born near that stop and in the neighborhoods a few blocks south and stretching west have average life expectancies 30 years less than babies born six stops north of us. 30 years, difference between 90 and 60, 30. Now, the south and west ends of the city are 95% non-white neighborhoods. Uh, the neighborhood six steps north on the red line is 2% non-white. The majority minority neighborhoods in my city tend to be impoverished. So this are th how, is how things are in one of the most segregated cities in the United States. Um, Proximity to a concentrated population of, I think, really beautifully educated people who are very good at making more of themselves hasn't made a dent on the trouble all around us. And my university has been in the neighborhood since 1890. So it's not like there wasn't enough time. We've never been good neighbors ever. When I first got there and was doing volunteer work on the south side, um, the people I was working with didn't believe I worked at the University of Chicago on the grounds that I was clearly a human being. So that, and they didn't seem to hire those at my institution. Now, I mean, I don't mean to, I mean, we've just started in the last 10 years, a few sort of service learning processes opportunities for our undergraduates at the University of Chicago. It's relatively new. It is not treated as a normal part of undergraduate education. It's treated as an extra thing that students can do. Um, now, I don't mean to suggest that my university should be differently politically engaged. I strongly agree with Elizabeth Corey's argument last night that universities begin to go off the rails when they're too focused on vocational training, political activism, or competitive advantage. 
I also share her sense that genuine liberal learning is intrinsically good and her eloquent defense of tradition, literally handing what is good to a new generation in a way that they can receive it, tradere, right, um, uh, is tremendously important. Now, it, I suppose it's possible that mine is a liberal arts institution that doesn't manage to foster genuine liberal learning for students. I mean, I don't think so. Um, my students are generally alive to the intrinsic value of knowledge and tradition. Many of our alumni are leaders in one or another sphere and think that their education at Chicago helped them get there. M my problem is I'm not sure that it always makes sense to follow where they lead. Um, the problem appears to be the problem of hooking together the two parts of the university's motto. Now, we can't solve the problem of integrating intellectual and personal development, in my experience, by just changing the curriculum, like rewriting the syllabus or something. I think we have to change how we teach, no matter what we teach. And I... Th Thanks. Um, and I think that the only way to change on the how end is by fostering a certain kind of community in our classrooms and working always to stress what's at stake in what we teach, why the things we teach matter, why anyone should care about how a question is formulated or the kinds of ways people have thought to think or address such a question. I teach a lot of work by people who've struggled a lot so I'm teaching a lot of work by people who are broken, have been broken by the very thing they're trying to figure out how to think. And that requires a certain kind of respect and receptivity um, in trying to learn from these things. Um, so we need to be willing to face the perils and possibilities inherent in allowing that our own ignorance is always, always, always bigger than the field of things that we know something about. We need humility. We need re receptivity to the insights and wisdom that we've inherited from those who've gone before us. We need the understanding that our intellectual and moral forebears face struggles and kinds of suffering that may be alien to us, but that are, in, but that are some part of our lot as human beings. We need to be willing and willingness to be open to the possibility that people who do not or have not shared some of our deepest commitments have insights that we really need. Now, my latest work on this front is with students who could be like the poster children for Tal's talk. Um, these are students in the new business track of the University of Chicago economics major brand new track. Um, economics is the biz biz biggest undergraduate major at my institution. There's this thing called the Chicago School of Economics. Um, it was invented by people like Hayek and Milton Friedman way back when. Um, it is a very powerful thing. I'm a moral philosopher at the University of Chicago. It finally, I finally couldn't resist it anymore about three years ago. And I thought, what am I doing being a moral philosopher at this university and not trying desperately to figure out how to serve those students? Obviously, I need to figure out how to serve those students. Um, um, before beginning work on a curriculum, for those students, I had a really long conversation with a colleague who's in econ and the business school called Luigi Zingales. This is the capitalism for the people guy. This guy is capitalism cubed, a free market guy. Uh, Luigi gave me a really important piece of advice. He said, you're gonna be working with students who will wind up having everything and being accountable to no one within five years of graduation, having everything and being accountable to no one. Now, um, I had never really thought 
even about what it would be like to have everything and be accountable to no one, <laughs> much less to make that my audience, <laughs> you know, for ethics. Um, and the students on the business track are mostly destined for careers in finance. Now, if you if you know anything about fields of study, that I jury is out on whether these just attract people with sort of muted moral sensibilities <laughs> or produce people with muted moral sensibilities, you'll know that law, economics, and business are these three areas, and that in econ and business, it's the finance people who score lowest on the notice what it did to somebody else scale. OK, um, many of the students I was about to meet will, would not have even asked themselves whether there might be some good things in human life that should not be distributed through markets. They're used to thinking that's the distribution. Um, and all of them, the ones I was going to meet, are better at math than I am even though my social science was math, because it was econ, right? Like, it's the only social science I have, this economics. OK. Keeping a coyness in my back pocket, however, I realize that these students, like all students, are my fellow human beings, that they all want to be and to do what is humanly good and avoid what is bad for people, where that good is moral good. It's not, there's not some make-believe kind of good that's like Candace good, not human good. That they're going to walk into my classroom with genuine moral knowledge, not just some opinions, even though they may not have realized that before they went through the door that they each have a spark of divinity in them, even though they may not notice that either. And because I'm a Christian educator in a secular institution, I can know in advance that Jesus died for every single one of them personally. That sets the standard for me with students. Um, now, 53 of these potentially terrifying eternal beings signed up for the course. Uh, as usual, I learned their names in advance by making the photo roster my prayer list. I'm actually terrible with names, but that's the way I have of learning their names before I meet them. Um, and then the job was to try to figure out how to help them with both intellectual and moral formation at the same time in a class where an awful lot of the readings look an awful lot like things they would be doing anyway in their ordinary course of study. And we've got some philosophy readings alongside them. The first job was to get everybody into the habit of recognizing that we are a learning community. And the easiest way to do that, besides being able to greet them by name when they walk through the door, which scares them. They've never seen me before. Um, <laughs> it, does, it shouldn't, but it does. Um, was to get everybody into the habit of greeting the other people in the room at the be before I say anything else in the lecture. Start with a greeting. And I joke about it. I say, look, I'm old. You know, I, I, I think that the fact that there's 57 humans in this room together is at least as interesting as what's in the readings. Um, and also, you may not realize this, but you are, but each of you is a really important educational resource for the other people in this room. I know you're used to thinking that I'm the educational resource. I, I hope I will be, but you're that for each other. So we greet each other at the beginning of every one of my lecture classes before I get into anything else. So we do that. Now, um, the readings 
were a lot like things that they would encounter in their other classes with the exception of some additional philosophy things. The assignments were distinctive. I'll talk about them if you want me to. Um, but each, I had each of them turn in a one-page reflective writing that would apply the very abstract material that we were doing in the class to some issue in their personal life, just one page each week. Um, I made them do on Thursdays. We had three Orthodox Jewish students and two Muslim men in the class for whom Friday is a holy day, so I wanted to get them before the holiday. I read their pieces um, and sent a few sentences in response to each student over the weekend. I mean, this is, I easily read more than 60 pages of stuff in any given weekend. It's a thing that I do. Um, almost never are those 60 pages as helpful as reading these one page things were. And it allowed me to start class the following Monday by giving everybody a kind of run through on how we were see how we were applying the stuff that we were reading about and learning about at the beginning of Monday's lecture. The graded assignments were all group assignments. I was uh, taking a page from our B school in that, um, and they had in these group assignments they had to find a solution to a practical business problem. They were in groups. I assigned the groups. They had to submit a short piece of writing that outlined their solution and described it. And then they had to produce a long piece of writing detailing the other alternatives they'd considered and why they rejected them. That was what the written work was like. I loved this class. I was actually scared of these students before I walked into this class because like most of, most of them are much better mathematicians than I will ever be. Who Chinese mathematicians in that room who are amazingly good. They loved this class. And being econ majors, they're networked <laughs> crazy with other econ majors. So I now have an econ number for this course and an invitation to just do the ethics for the econ major. I also now have um, a number of econ students who are doing joint econ philosophy majors. I'm supervising them. Um, and right at this moment, I have six econ students in an upper division course on Kant's moral philosophy that I'm teaching. Um, they're all networked like crazy, so word gets around in their group really fast. Um, so it turned out that um, my first econ students were afraid that I wasn't going to respect them because they were in the business of getting and spending. And I was some sort of lofty humanities person who would look down my nose at them. But these students were starved for a chance to think seriously about what they're doing and why, and about all the kinds of moral peril that they're going to face as they move forward in life. That is, Aquinas was right. These are my fellow human beings, and human flourishing in the bounds of virtue matters to them deeply. They come still to office hours to try to talk about all kinds of problems and try to think through all kinds of things. Um, and they're sort of, some, so we have a lot of those kinds of discussions still. And I now have three people who are double majoring in econ and philosophy. Um, but why I'm saying all of this to you is that even if it can be hard to imagine 
remaking the whole of the university so that it more accurately reflects the kind of humanistic charge that I think everybody in this room feels the university has. That university is made up of our fellow human beings. And in all these kind of teeny tiny ways, it's possible to help even if you're bringing stuff that they're not used to getting, and even if you're kind of afraid of them, that the human thirst to do things that are meaningful and deep is real. And it gives you something you can bank on all the time in your students. Thank you. We have just a few minutes for questions, and we have microphones here uh, at the front. So if you'd like to ask a question, uh, will you please uh, come on up and identify yourself? Just have a few minutes before we're able to uh, uh, adjourn and uh, depart for worship, and I'll give you some idea about that. Please, questions for these. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, whoa, for your comments. Um, I was going to ask you this later, so <laughs> this might be a little embarrassing for me, but as a, um, a survivor of the University of Chicago, um, uh, MA and PhD, um, do, you, do you teach both undergrads and graduate students? Yes, I do. Um, I teach a lot. I guess... I'm wondering um, if you've had conversations about your pedagogy with your colleagues and how you think your colleagues would um, respond to having pedagogy workshops, if you guys do that sort of thing. That's where I will stop. I, I, I myself work on pedagogy a lot but my colleagues mostly don't. Um, and I am not sure. I'm not sure how they would respond to pedagogy workshops. Um, we're like a lot of places where people act like you already know how to teach. Um, even though the closest you've come to any preparation for it is probably a little tiny bit or a lot of TAing when you were a doctoral student with people who were not super sensitive teachers. Um, I've got, uh, I've currently got a postdoc and part of the reason for the postdoc is to try to help somebody work on teaching a little bit. Um, and that's, I'm hoping that that's helping. Um, we at least are talking an awful lot and engaging an awful, awful lot in this stuff. Um, I wanted to ask about the role of community in teaching. Uh, so I suspect that lots of students come to the universities these days, both UVA and Chicago, with a conjuries of different purposes going in different directions, different goals they all have. And the university doesn't constrain them to have one or like a discrete set of purposes. Do you see the kind of community building that you might do at the beginning of a class or within a class over the course of the semester as trying to cope with that uh, difficulty? Go ahead. I mean, I do. Uh, I, uh, we, we greet each other at the beginning of every one of my classes, big lecture classes, and I have all kinds of techniques in smaller classes that are meant to get them
to appreciate each other in all kinds of ways. Um, so it turns out that something as apparently ridiculous and easy to do as having them say hello to each other in a big lecture class at the beginning of each session, having that be part of your repertoire in a lecture class, all by itself enough to alter the feeling in the room. So something that little helps to produce a kind of community in a classroom. And then there's all kinds of other ways of doing that as well. But there, um, I'm a big believer in community, especially because I'm hoping that if I'm doing my job, something scary is going to happen. And we will need each other at least once during the term because with any luck, there's going to be some question or issue that's actually hard. And being with each other and having each other gives us strength to face it. By, by noon tomorrow, I'm supposed to vote, along with all of the faculty at UVA, on uh, a new general education uh, program that we've been experimenting with on a trial basis for just some of our students uh, for the last couple of years. And I was on the committee that uh, designed it, or at least the early phase of the committee. It's not quite what I hoped it would be, and this was something that we talked a lot about at the early, in, in the early days of thinking about general education. We're a pretty large state institution, not as large as many others, but still not small, and it's a little bit difficult to uh, to get students in a position where they can feel that they're in community with respect to uh, shared academic questions. Uh, but one thing that we have done uh, is, and, and that by voting for this, I'll, I'll be casting my vote in favor of continuing, uh, is that we have uh, created a, a speaker series uh, that's just for the first year students and a couple of common readings uh, with the hope that that would provide something, some little bit of a common experience that all first years could just assume the other first years were also a part of, and that that might uh, provoke a kind of conversation and build a kind of community uh, that would at least be there as a, uh, you know, in play with all the other kinds of connections and shared experiences that our students have. Um, and it, it's a very imperfect solution. It's a very partial sort of solution. But we've also been experimenting with having some members of the entering class uh, commit themselves to a two-year track that they share together as groups of 30 students led by a particular professor. Uh, and uh, then that professor would have them for the first semester of their first year there for one of their classes and then would lead a capstone seminar uh, at the end of the second year that would sort of weave together some of the themes that as a group they've wound their way through from around the university and that give coherence to their particular chosen track. I think that, again, these are imperfect and partial solutions, but we're, we're grappling with this issue, uh, just finding some way to create academic community as, 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 and to give it a place on, on a campus that has uh, lots of other sorts of centers of gravities and formative experiences that uh, that you know have little to do with the classroom. It, it's a difficult issue in a large institution. Final question. <laughs> I just want to demonstrate to you that I'm not an angry black man, <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say that. I'm new in this culture, I'm new in this space, and there's a part of me that's disappointed that we're still having this conversation, and that the faith community seems to be more, um, it's like the culture is dragging us on, on we're not willing, we're, we're being dragged into the culture. We seem not to understand Matthew and Luke describe Jesus as a friend of sinners. We intellectualize that, but we don't quite understand how to live that. And so part of me, I'm frustrated because we're not having the conversation that pushes us past denomination and rules and structure and history that takes people to the heart of where our culture 
and our community needs to be. And I so uh, uh, appreciate how you aptly described your work at the University of Chicago. Um, but I want us, I want to move. I want us to do what we know is right to do and transform hearts and minds so that we transform communities at a time when the culture is demanding that we rise to a more significant place. So it's more of a statement, I guess in, in some ways frustration, that I want us to move beyond the talk. Amen. <laughs> One of the ways in which we can be transformed is to worship together. And that's what we'll do now. We encourage each and every one of you to join us for worship that we have planned at the Paul W. Powell Chapel of George W. Truett Theological Seminary, which is on uh, 3rd Street, which is the street uh, right in front of this business school. A number of you have already spent time at Truett Theological Seminary uh, for the administrator's workshop. I'll count on some of you to lead these who uh, may not know exactly where Truett is uh, down the street. Uh, we have worship planned and we'll begin as close to 515 as we can. Thank you so much to Tal Brewer and to Candace Vogler. Thank you.